the monster throws a shitty one-liner. I think he yeah. says something about old bollocks or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, is, it, is, he, is he British? <laughs> Apparently. I mean, what the f- <laughs> It's not funny. I'm like laughing in despair. It's like so <laughs> bad, isn't it? Yes. Hi, and welcome to a new episode of Bad Movies and Swedish Opinions. Uh, today we had a pleasure to look at the movie called Gods of Egypt, where you can find on the Netflix. It was released in the year 2016. The director is Alex Proyas, and the writers are Matt Sasama and Burke Sharpless. Uh, I really like... Burke's last name, Sharpless. I don't think he's the sharpest tool in the shed, right? <laughs> uh, hilarious. You know, <laughs> when I read his last name, I was like, I gotta make a joke about this, but I really, I didn't really like find a good one. But is was that okay? Uh, sure. It suits the theme of the movie because it also has stupid one-liners. Exactly. And speaking of that, let's walk right into the movie. Uh, So let's talk about the plot first. Uh, I think we're going to walk through it a bit, uh, not as deep as we might uh, do in these occasions, but uh, we will still talk about a lot of scenes and characters uh, because the biggest problem with this movie isn't really uh, the story itself. It's more about how the shoes to work with the story i would say and i think about this movie is also that it's two hours long so if you go through the story in detail we'll be sitting here all day mm-hmm. maybe people like that or maybe they like that no one likes us that much no okay so uh who wants to take us through the plots so uh the title kind of says it all. The movie is called Gods of Egypt. So it takes place in Egypt. And the gods, they live together with the humans. And they are like the ruling caste. So the king of Egypt is a god. And yeah, king of Egypt rules Egypt. And the current king of Egypt is uh, Osiris. And when the movie starts, he's about to pass the crown on to his son, uh, Horus. But at the ceremony, Horus' uncle, Seth, uh, decides to rebel, and he kills Osiris. Uh, He beats Horus badly, takes both his eyes, and then he takes the crown, so he becomes the new god of Egypt. And then the movie is pretty much about how they will stop Seth somehow. Right, right, right. It's basically about revenge and to, you know, reclaim the throne, at least from Horus' perspective. We have some, we have a lot of characters here to work with. Um, too many, I would say, because, you know, we always get, every person in a story always has their own story. And if a person or a character is within a movie, you kind of automatically want to know something about them, which takes time. So I'm not usually a big fan of many characters in a movie, and I'm not uh, that now either. But let's let's work through the characters, at least the three important ones, and then we'll mention the 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 five under ones, uh, including the the space monster. Uh, I I think the space monster deserves a character. Uh, So let let's start up with Beck, who is. Beck. I have written here in my notes that he's an Aladdin character that never fails. Yeah, he is a Mary Sue. He he always succeeded at his first try with basically everything. Do we like yeah. Beck? Or do you? I don't like Beck. He is uh, really annoying, has stupid humor, and he's annoyingly good at everything, so not much depth. And why don't we like characters that always succeeds in everything? Because it's not interesting to watch. You can't feel 
empathy or anything because what's the point right usually when characters always you know succeeds with everything you kind of you know going the opposite you're kind of starting to hate that character yes. and and it's 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 because it's so far from real life it's it's nothing that you can relate to and it's always you know whatever he's going to do in the movie it's not going to be a surprise because he's going to succeed with it so uh, it's it's not interesting as you say Ruben. it's just like okay he's 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 up with a new plan and he's going to do this and automatically you'll know that he will succeed and it will all turn up good. Yeah. And in this movie, it's, it's really strange as well because most of the other characters are gods that have like godlike powers, but he's just a normal human. But still, he can do everything that they do, but sometimes even better. It's really annoying. Some god even comments that, that, are you sure you're not a god, just a human, you know, because you succeed at everything? Okay. Mm. I hope he was sarcastic with that one. It's like, you're overdoing everything. Like, mm. he was like being a dick towards him, but he never got that. Um, <laughs> so, so Beck is a huge problem with this movie, I would say. We haven't even started uh, to to discuss the movie, but I can tell you this, that Beck is a big problem for me, at least. Uh, and at, that one character can be such a huge impact of a movie in a bad way is actually impressive. <coughs> Cough, Ray. <coughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, I would say Ray, and I will also say Captain Marvel. Yes. And it has nothing to do that there are two <laughs> women characters. It's just... Well, now we have back two as an example, and that's good. Maybe that's yeah. what the director wanted. A male example <laughs> of, you know, Ray. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, Beck, of course, uh, needs to have, you know, a team to, to work with. And his team is Horus. And who is Horus? I've written here in my, in my uh, character sheet that he is Jamie Lannister. He is Jamie Lannister. That the same actor. He most definitely is. Yeah. So uh, he's supposed to be new king of Egypt, but Seth kicks his ass and takes the crown. So Horus begins an epic journey to find the strength he needs to defeat Seth. So he and Beck they travel together through the whole movie on their quest. Horus is a bit of an arrogant prick most of the movie. I mean, uh, you know that in many movies, a character or a person finds their way of acting, and you always and in, and some of the directors try to apply that into a movie. You mean you have like numerous examples of that? Uh... We talked about that recently. How Charlie Sheen always is Charlie Sheen in every movie, right? For instance, yeah, and Jamie Lannister uh, is definitely Jamie Lannister in this movie. He's as you say, I'm a very arrogant, self-in-love uh, person, you know. So it, it really shines through. Yeah. And I got to say, if, if you're supposed to be some sort of god that's lazy and you don't really need to do anything because, you know, you don't really have a job, you're a prince or whatever, I think that it's okay to, to, to have a character like this you know that has everything that he wants and doesn't need to work for anything of course he's going to turn up to be you know a, a douche but apparently he can still fight because they mentioned it a few times that he defeated 42 demons uh, for the goddess of love yeah and it's good that they throw that in because otherwise I would say it makes no sense for him to, to be this strong god so I I, I kind of like that they throw in you know some sm some small exposure about this character. It helps him later on. Um, yeah, I guess so. And then we have a character called Seth. He's the main villain, and he wants to destroy the world for some reason. Yeah, and he's played by Gerald Butler. Right. Do we like Gerald Butler? We had. It's the second time that he's a part of our series here now. The last one was, uh, what's it called? Game Over or? Gamer. Gamer, right, right, right. I yeah. actually like Gerald Butler. 
Yeah, I like him too. I, I feel like uh, neither this movie or Gamer is really his fault because I actually think that he does a pretty good job. But I would say of the actors in this movie, I think that he's the best one. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think he does a good job of playing the villain. He's overdoing it sometime, but I, as you say, Ruben, I don't think it's his fault. I think it's the script's fault because... And maybe the director too, because it really wants him to act, act not like a typical villain, you know, that only wants to get things done. But he needs to be cocky and overconfident and throw in one-liners, which is a big, huge part of this movie. Because what's better than a cool one-liner? Well, mm. 500 of them is a problem. No. Yeah. Okay, and then we have some other characters that we are just going to mention uh, because they will probably pop up during some uh, discussions here. Um, we have Heifer. Uh, she's the god of love and also Lannister's girlfriend. And FYI, yes, I'm going to refer as Horus as Jamie Lannister. <laughs> uh, we have Saya, and she's also a girlfriend, but she's girlfriend to Beck. And they they kind of, you know, have this typical happy... American dream relationship, uh, which they really like throw at you in the beginning of the movie. But we'll talk more about that. And then we have Osiris, and he is the current king, uh, and he also Jamie Lannister's father in this movie. Um, and he gets killed in the beginning here by Seth. And then we have Ra, which is God of Light, and he hangs on a boat to, to fight a monster, Apophis, which we will probably refer to as the space monster. Because Apophis doesn't say much. I wonder if that means anything. Eh, darkness, maybe? or something. Um, something. Did you think it was a cool monster? Or just like, meh? Uh, it's a smoky space slug with lots of teeth. Exactly. Mm. It's the monster from Lost. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Good. Okay, so let's let's start to talk about the story, I would say. Because, um, as you said, Adam, it's basically about Horus, Jamie Lannister, to, to get back to the throne. What, yeah. what do you think about the story, to begin with? Uh, the, the premise of the movie. The premise, I actually like. I, I can like the idea of basing this on Egyptian mythology and... There's nothing wrong with the premise itself, how Horus is beaten, loses all his powers, then a human helps him recover some of that power, and they go on a journey together to defeat Seth. I think that on paper, that's a pretty good story. Yeah, I yeah. like it too. Yeah, I was actually... Um, I, I'm, I'm not a super fan of, you know, uh, the, the prologue of movies. Usually, you know, when someone needs to explain something, but in this movie, it makes sense. Uh, it kind of lays the ground to the movie, and you get to hear about the history, about how the gods wants to live. They, they created a kingdom so good, Egypt in this case, that they also want to, to live in it uh, mm. with the humans. Uh, of course... When gods is going to live among us, they need to be kings and queens and whatnot. They can't just be a blacksmith or anything. They always need to be the the, the shit of everything. Mm -hmm. They know best, right? Right. Right. So, uh, I kind of like the story. That's just what I, I need to, to sum up. Now, yeah. we're going to talk about a bit about how the characters are introduced to each other. So, if we start to talk about Beck and Saya... Uh, Saya, who is Beck's girlfriend. Uh, one thing that I had a problem with, this is the beginning of the movie when the characters are introduced, is that they always need to overdo this. If they want to show you the relationship between two people in the beginning of something, you only have a few minutes, then of course you need to throw it into your face. Mm. And, then, and then usually two things happen. Uh, one, uh, it's super forced. It kind of feels like it, they just met five minutes ago and they're super in love. Real relationships aren't like that, which make it uh, impossible for you to, to relate to it. A.K.A. the, the Hollywood uh, 
uh, yeah, people mm-hmm. in Hollywood being in love. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing is that they are so clean. I mean, they live in a they live in a, the in, in uh, some sort of trashy house somewhere, but uh, they have perfect hair, they have makeup, and they, they, their clothes isn't torn up. I mean, yeah. I, I don't buy it. They're, yeah, they're supposed to not have uh, money to buy stuff because he steals clothes for her and stuff in the beginning. Yeah, Beck is a well-known thief. He's very good at being a thief in this movie. As we said, he doesn't really fail of anything. But, you know... It doesn't really make sense. Uh, I think it really it destroys the illusion of them being poor. I mean, it's just like, you know, travel to Beverly Hills or something, pointing towards a house where two people live and say, those two, they are poor. They don't look like it, but they are. And it destroys the illusion of uh, of the movie, I think. Why not just throw some dirt on there, remove the makeup, turn up the hair a bit? But it doesn't hurt the movie. actors need to look attractive. That's what they want. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the thing too. With these two actors, Beck and uh, Sayas, uh, actors, it feels like they're only in the movie because they're good looking. Because their acting is very bad, in my opinion. Mm. You can't you can't say much about Saya because he doesn't really have much screen time. But yeah, she's not that very good. But Beck is even worse. You yeah, you said it. You, you, yeah, yeah you're, you're going to say it now. I, I, yeah, it feels like they are theater acting in exactly. a movie, mm. which is like more over the top and stuff, <laughs> and it doesn't really work well in a movie setting. No, exactly. For the difference between theater, theater acting and and movie acting is that since people are sitting around a stage, you kind of really need to over exaggerate your moves, your voice, your facial expressions, which it, it it works in a in a in a theater because you know everybody needs to see this. But in a movie, it doesn't make sense because you know it's supposed to reflect the real life. I'm doing air quotes now, but it's supposed to reflect it. And theater isn't really that. It's just supposed to be like some sort of you know uh, entertainment for for the people. Yeah. And then we have the introduction of Jamie Lannister and Seth. How how do they meet? Seth basically walks up on the stage during the crowning ceremony and then he brings an army and he's like, okay, I'm taking over. And then he kills Osiris and Horus like, oh, I'm going to stop you. And Horus and Seth fight. Seth kicks his ass and takes his eyeballs. And yeah, then he lets Horus live. And that's the end of that. Yeah, there's a lot of, about. I, I think it's a lot to talk about here in the beginning, because it really defines the movie. I would say, because you know, I mean, the the bad and the good about it. Because you know, let let let's say let's talk about how Set are introduced, because Set uh, apparently doesn't seem to be invited into this. You know, this uh, this over this passing over the crone thing between. Uh, Osiris and uh, Horus, Jamie Lannister, and then it it just he just appears from nowhere and starts to create chaos. I, I am not a fan of that. I think it would have made more sense if he were invited, but then you know try to uh, overtake the throne by force by you know some dialogue towards Jamie Lannister, and then you know. Uh, snap his finger or something, and then there's like a huge army approaching the the the, the stage. You know, it's a power move. I would think mm-hmm. that would made more sense because now he just appears from nowhere, and we we don't even know that he exists, and and then they need to explain it. Oh, you're Seth, God of whatever. It's just unnecessary dialogue. I think it would be better if you just were there from the beginning. Yeah, and yeah. then we have uh, have their fighting scene. Uh, that you mentioned. Yeah, exactly. The other pol- problem about this, or the good and the bad in this movie, is the fighting scene. I think it's kind of, you know, uh, explains itself here. Uh, it starts off with Seth and Jamie fighting each other. And, you know, in the beginning, I would say, it's a pretty cool fight. It's 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 well, you know... Uh, it's, Choreographed. It's, 
exactly well choreographed. Uh, they they mix in some small CGI, you know, with uh, with a with a shield exploding or not, and they're mixing it up with you know slow mo scenes. And I, I thought that was a really good fight, and that is the part that I like about this movie. But then they switch over to to the god mode because they're gods and they can transform into anything. It says, but they transform into this some sort of robotic monster thing, mm-hmm. and now the entire scene is just CGI, and it's it's never the same thing. The CGI in this movie isn't very impressive, suddenly. No, I, I try to think about uh, another movie where uh, CGI kind of ruins it instead of making it better, and I I guess there's a lot, but you know I would say the for the the episode one to three uh, Star Wars movies. I there's... think of another example also. Uh, if you know the Black Panther movie that have a CGI fight at the very end, uh, like Black Panther and the main villain, and I think that kind of ruined it a bit because it doesn't look good. Yeah, because everything else in the movie looks really good, and then the end fight is. Like just computer animated, it looks weird. Yeah, exactly. And you can clearly see it's computer animated, and that really ruins the flow of the movie. Yeah, yeah, because they they can never make it as good as they want to. I believe that the the graphics, the graphics, graphics. What's the plural word for it? Doesn't matter. The people working with graphics, they really want to do this like really good but you know it's it's all about motion you know it's never going to be the same thing as a person moving to, to make yeah. it as fluent it's like more jerky you know it's it you can clearly tell that that's not natural natural movement exactly and then we're back to the illusion of the movie because it's it it's gets destroyed by it Less CGI or mix it together with real people. I would say that's more fine. I don't really like this entirely CGI scenes. It's just a green screen and there's nothing on it. Mm. And no one is really acting. Yeah. And then we have the introductions between our two main characters, Beck and Horus. Where do they meet? Beck and his girlfriend basically steal plans for... A- uh, sets pyramid where he has hidden one of uh, Jamie's eyes, and uh, they find these plans and they decide that Beck should try to steal them or steal it by infiltrating the pyramid, which should basically be impossible, but he manages to do it anyway. Uh, Does so, it look impossible? Well, it doesn't really, but it should be. It's like just like cows or whatever, dropping off gold into a hole and he hides in a, in the back of that wagon that drops gold into the hole. So, mm. eh, I don't know. Then I mean, he... we're back to to the problem here with Big, that he succeeds with everything. I mean, yeah. you could give anyone, I mean, he's the most athletic person in the world. You can give him how many chances that he need. He will mm. never, ever make it through there. No, so anyway, he ends up inside this pyramid, and it has three bridges that all lead to uh, to uh, Horus's eye, and he has to like finish three trials, which I guess is pretty interesting because Egypt mythology has a lot of traps and stuff, you know, poison darts and uh, swords and stuff. Indian but, Yon shit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's kind of Egypt, a pretty obvious e- Egypt thing to have. So he has to figure out three trials, and he, of course, finishes all three without even breaking a sweat, basically. He finds the eye and gets out of there, grabs his girlfriend, and then when they are they are fleeing the city... His girlfriend is hit with an arrow through the heart, basically, so she dies. Quite unexpected. Yeah. So yeah. I guess they arrive at the temple where Osiris and his wife is buried, and Jamie Lannister is sobbing in there because he has no eyes and he's depressed and whatever. So uh, Beck gives him the eye after agreeing to uh, bring. Uh, 
his girlfriend back to life, he will give him the eye and helping help him uh, get the other eye back so he can take the throne from Sith. Right. It's good that you mention mentioning the, the eye because I think it's important for us to, to mention the, the thing here with Sith. Um, what is the purpose of him? What what does he want and what does he do? Because as you say, he for some reason has Jamie Lannister's eyes. But why does he? Why do he have them? Turns out that after he became king, he instantly became a dictator. So more or less enslaved all humans and forced them to work. And at the same time, he's he has built huge armies and he has conquered all known lands and then turns out he has been collecting these parts from different gods because he wants to add them to himself so he can have the powers of the other gods right so he's some sort of you know acquiring every god's power in order to make himself a super god yes great uh, so now with that, when we got that out of the way, so okay, so Horus and I mean Jamie Lannister, I almost used his whole name. Uh, Jamie Lannister and Beck, they meet up, and they agree to help each other. Uh, Beck will help Jamie to retrieve his second eye, and Jamie will help Beck uh, get his girlfriend back from the dead. What do you think about their goal together? Do you think it makes sense? Do you think it's something that you would accept to to happen that it gives them both a reason to to stay together? I'm I don't know. I guess, but it it feels so weird. Beck is just pretty much useless to Horus by this point. I think he's basically just protecting him and doing shit throughout the rest of the movie. I mean, Beck has his uses, but he seems kind of just forced in there sometimes. Yeah, but if we look from Jamie's perspective here, Beck was a, was still able to retrieve his one eye. And mm. based on that, he should be able to retrieve the second one. Except neither one of them know exactly where the other eye is. But okay. Yeah, they don't really know much about the eye. I don't think they even know where it is. They just assume, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And Jamie's going to bring uh, Saya back from the death. I gotta say, I didn't really like the way uh, Saya was killed. I, I like that it was unexpected. I, I never I never hate those kind of things because when something unexpected happens and it doesn't really follow the, the usual flow of a movie, I, I usually like it. But here it felt like, oh shit, we forgot to kill off Saya. Oh yeah, you're right. How should we do it? I don't know, They, when they are trying to flee, why not just shoot her in the heart or something? Yeah, sure, that works. I it actually just like felt that. Like, it because, felt like lazy writing for me. But it makes sense. I mean, when you're trying to run away like that, you're an easy target. So of course they're able to shoot her. Yeah, but they only like hit her with one arrow and they don't hit, hit him. I don't know, it's, it's just felt so lazy. I mean, I think something, it should have rained errors or something or something more to happen even or to make me believe that they were fleeing for something because there was only arrows it wasn't really much two arrows i think mm -hmm. i think they should have thrown more stuff into it to make it more chaos they like it they like chaos in these movies i don't know why they didn't do it <laughs> they, yeah but they, not blew where all, where yeah. Sense. they blew all the budget on the cgi fights right <laughs> Yeah, so uh, at least Saya is dead, and, and Jamie promised to, to bring her back. He's lying, by the way. He can't. He, and he, and in, in Jamie's defense, he actually did say it before to Beck that he's not able to do this. But then, when Jamie realized that he need Beck help to retrieve the second eye, he kind of, you know, made up a new story. So mm. I would play. I, I would put this on Beck. Beck is stupid. Beck should have gotten this. Mm -hmm. That maybe is lying to me in order for me to help him. Okay, so now we've gotten the characters out of the way. I think we should discuss, you know, the middle movie here. Because uh, there's a lot of stuff happening, but we're not going to go through it, like, yeah. you know, it, from point A to B. It's no. not very interesting. No, it's just stuff is happening. Because this is a journey. So they're, like, walking from point A to B, and stuff are happening. And 
I think it's more important to talk about why we don't like the things that we do or don't. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to, to bring up one thing first. Um, and that is Beck's ability to, to survive everything. And also the characters that interfere with him seem to be stupid. Because this is a mortal guy. You could just throw him off a cliff. So in the beginning here, uh, uh, when Beck and, and Jamie first met, they, they kind of realized that they need to talk to Ra, Jamie's grandfather. So uh, they talk to Ra and they get back down to, to this rock or whatever, Earth. And then they get, you know, uh, attacked by uh, Seth's huntsmen. And they kind of grab hold of Beck right away, hold him off a cliff and ask him questions. I have no problem with this. This makes sense. They're trying to get some information out of him. But when they realize that Jamie is behind them, why not just throw Beck off a cliff? Why would you care about this character to just lay him down on the floor? Yeah, makes no sense. No, and this happens a lot. Why not just kill him? Kill Beck, for fuck's sake. <laughs> it's just a human. Nobody gives a shit. If you're a god, you shouldn't care about this. Yeah, it happens a lot as well. It's really annoying. Right. And I, I just have a hard problem with this, because if they want Beck to survive, they need to, to fix it by, you know making him, you know, be able to fight himself off or whatever in order to, to make it sense. Because if you were a god and you were capture a human, you would just throw him off a cliff. That's it. Yeah. 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 And then they move on. And, you know, this is a story about their relationship. So, uh, how? of course, they will hate each other in the beginning and then they start to, to care for each other. This is the typical, you know, medicine for, for movies. Yeah, typical uh, new partner cop thing. Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, how do you think their relationship is uh, growing on each other? Do you think they're doing a good job of, you know, gradually introduce that? No. I think the relationship feels pretty stiff. Yeah, I'm forced. Mm-hmm. Why? <sighs> I think it's because neither characters were relatable, so it's hard to imagine that they have like a realistic relationship. Yeah, and none of them are taking anything seriously, so it just makes this part of the movie feel unnecessary and silly in some ways. That's a big problem with this movie, that even in a dead series and intense moments, they come up with a one-liner, and that ruins the seriousness. Exactly. This movie should be more serious than it is. As we said in the beginning, we kind of like the premise. It think it has great potential, but the unnecessary comedy ruins the movie. And the comedy is also not good. It's supposed to be some sort of absurdity and one-liners. That's pretty much it. They're playing. They're playing on. You know, oh, this this is a serious scene, but we're being stupid. <laughs> It's not funny. It's just lazy writing. And also, you can't really decide if it is a serious movie or not. So you're kind of stuck in between, which makes it worse. This is a problem with many big movies. It seems that they want to appeal to everyone, both the people that like dead serious and the people that like comedy. So they try to mix in a bit of both, and that kind of ruins it because it can't be easy. They can't be both at the same time. They should stick to one. Right. I call this for Disney directing that you mm-hmm. always throw in it's it's in Paris Caribbean, it's in the new Star Wars movie, it's in surely other movies, but it's 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 playing on its own, you know. This is a serious scene, but I will say something stupid and then it's funny. I mean they yeah. do that all the time and I hate it. I really hate it. Because as Otto says, they try to appeal to everyone and you can't do that. Some people will not like this and someone will. You can't get both. Unless it's yeah. Endgame. Yeah, but they, they do it pretty well in the Marvel movies. But that's because it's superheroes and it's always been kind of jokey in the comics even. And it's it's that tone. But they, they try to em- emulate that tone in this movie, but they don't have 
the actors to pull it off and not the jokes to pull it off and it's just awkward and stupid yeah so they should have you know focused on this to be only a serious movie because they have they have a lot of well known actors in this movie they, and the actors that they are using uh, Jero Butler and Rufus from A Knight's Tale and uh, I can't even remember everyone but uh, I mean they have characters enough to make this a serious movie because these characters are usually they are they are kind of you know used to working with serious movies or serious dialogue and serious scenes more than ridiculous one-liners and comedy that's not really comedy yeah so moving on uh there's also one scene that i also don't like or um, exactly the, the same reasons it's when two snakes uh, attack them jamie and beck have reached a place for some reason that used to be a garden but that osiris his father donated to people in order to bury their dead a nice gesture i guess i think this scene is supposed to you know uh, represent uh, jamie's character change that he kind of realizing that he's being selfish and a douche and that he needs to change in order to be a good person uh, to me this is one of the most unnecessary scenes in the movies because it I don't know. It feels like a waste of time, most of it. Yeah, so when he realized this, they need to, you know, make some sort of action of this. So Seth has sent two new huntsmen in order to kill him. And yeah. this time it's two big snakes and two women riding them. Which I now kind of think of, isn't there a dick joke there somewhere? <laughs> I was just thinking that. Yeah, exactly. I'm surprised that you didn't mention it before, since you know <laughs> you or you. No, I just realized it now when describing it. Okay, so Jamie and uh, Beck they try to get away from these big snakes, and I mean, it doesn't make sense because these are fire breeding animals that's like i don't know 15 meters in length or whatever and maybe more and they're super fast but and but beck and jamie can just run away from them and jump or do whatever in order to escape their fire and it's just chaos and it just starts to you know zone away because it's not interesting because this has happened now three four times i think in the movie already and you're kind of getting tired of it a lot of action where there don't have to be action. It just draws out the movie, and of course it has to be as quick and stupid as possible. Exactly. So this this could have just been Jamie realizing that he needs to change, that's fine, and then move on. Mm -hmm. But they, they don't need to make every scene some sort of action-filled shit show. Because a movie can still be entertaining in a, in a low part of the movie. It doesn't need to be all ups, you know. Uh, yeah, especially in this movie where the CGI is so exaggerated. It's like everywhere. So it feels very pointless. Yeah, exactly. Let's move on towards, you know, the pyramid. Because this is an exact same uh, scene as the, the, the last one we talked about. Do you know which scene I mean, Adam? Yeah, I know which scene you mean. Well, to be fair, it can be most scenes where Beck is involved because Beck is going to solve this because Beck can do everything. Exactly. So explain to us what this big pyramid is, what the point is, and how they solve this. Well, so they enter this pyramid and well, they're about to enter and it turns out it has a lot of entrances and Beck kind of guesses which entrance that's the correct one and he runs up past all the traps and he manages to shut down this whole defense system so everyone can enter mm. right so it is a pyramid that's supposed to be some sort of box that you need to solve in order to to get in it's a super easy thing to solve if you're a human maybe it's harder if you're a god because you're bigger but otherwise i i, I thought this was really stupid 
it was. Yeah, it gets worse. So now they're inside, and as you said, Autumn, it closed down the mechanics, and people can walk in. Uh, so now everybody's uh, gathered inside a pyramid in order to retrieve Jamie's second eye. And then something stupid happens, and a big monster appears. And then you think, oh no, it's going to be another fight scene again. Uh, at least we don't get that exactly, but we get something else that I didn't really ask for. It's supposed to be some sort of riddle. Okay, so you passed the main gate, and now you need to answer a riddle in order to pa- get past him. Isn't that stupid? Well, that's all from Egyptian mythology, so I didn't have a problem with that per se. What I did have a problem with was that the riddle was so general that they actually gave answers that would be correct but he wanted another specific answers so they didn't actually give a wrong answer just it was a riddle with many possible answers but maybe that's good if you don't want anyone to be able to pass then give them something they can't answer yeah but it feels like cheating yeah and also in the mythology i think they only have one shot to actually get the answer correct and if they don't they die but here they have like three, four, five tries to solve it. Yeah, and also this this monster that they are fighting, uh, just a short bit, but they're fighting. I mean, it is possible to get through him because yeah. he's very big and he's very slow. So I, I I would just like, okay, I don't know the riddle, so I just run through his legs or something. I just thought that was stupid. I think they should have done it more in, more visually impossible for them to get through it so they need to answer the riddle correct otherwise it just it's not possible to walk through it uh yeah well they answered the uh, riddle correctly of course and they walk through him and before they do that the monster throws a shitty one-liner i think he yeah. says something about old bollocks or something <laughs> yeah like, is, it, is, like he, is he british Apparently. I mean, what the f- It's not funny. I'm like laughing in despair. It's like so <laughs> bad, isn't it? Yes. I mean, I guess it's supposed to be funny that you make something British because British people are always funny, you know, because the way they talk. We're at the end of the movie uh, where Seth and Beck and Jamie is supposed to do the last fight. So they retrieve the eye and uh, and and Seth have gotten a hold of it, I think. Yeah, because yes. he's yeah, so he's he's collected a bunch of powers now and he's going to uh to uh, implement them on himself so it turns into this robot figure and they kind of you know use some sort of blacksmith methods in order to attach them and now he's a super god. That's basically it. He's gotten th- what he wants. Yeah, the thing is that he, he is basically the most powerful thing now, but he can still die by aging, I guess. So he has to like destroy the underworld and basically the rest of the world because of that. Just kill everyone else so he can't die. Right, right, right. So his goal is to be the most powerful god ever and also not die. He can live for like thousands of years, but thousands of years is not forever. Mm-hmm. So he kills his uh, father, then the monster, the space monster kind of roams free on the world now in order to kill, uh, to, to eat up the underworld. And Seth just, you know, needs to wait at this point, I think. I guess. Yeah, I guess so. So he just needs to wait to, to the space monster to do his thing. Uh, but then, of course, Speck and uh, Jamie interferes and try to kill him. Yeah. yeah, a battle happens, and basically, uh, Beck is about to die, and Horus can choose to either save his eye or save Beck. So he cho- chooses to save Beck, but Beck still dies afterwards. So I don't know what the point of that was. Right. But... So Beck has gotten. Uh... He's he's been able to remove the eye from Seth in order to give it back to Jamie, and we actually said before that Beck su- succeeds with everything. But come to think of it, he actually fails now because when he is rolling down this tilting rock place, he throws the stone towards Jamie. 
in order for him to catch it and reattach it to himself. But it's the worst throw I have ever seen. It's not even close. No, Jesus it's Christ. Exactly. I mean, if you want to relate that, you can't even relate to that because that was too bad. I mean, it wasn't <laughs> even close. It's so bad. They're like three meters. In, with the, they're only three meters like apart from each other. You only need to like throw it. You no, know, here, catch. But no, he throws it awfully. Really bad. It makes Jamie to choose between his eye and, you know, Beck. He chooses Beck, saves Beck. Beck dies anyway. And the eye is gone. Uh, for a couple of minutes at least. So, yeah, Jamie kills Seth and all is good. He gives, he, he removes the space monster and everything is fine. There's so much to unpack here. It's there like, is. There's so much happening. You can't even like eat it all up because it's too much. Yeah, it's mostly chaos. Yeah, for starters, there's no way he should be able to beat Seth in the end because Seth had all his god powers. And Jamie only had like a, like fifty percent of his power due to the eyes. And you gotta remember that at start, uh, Seth beat Horus back when Horus had both his eyes, and Seth only had his own gut powers. Yeah, so it doesn't make sense. And also, it's not a super good fight because you know it, it changes from you know real time fighting to uh, CGI again, mm-hmm. which also sucks. It yep. does. There Dude, is. Uh, <laughs> There is one thing I want to bring up also that you see this one scene that the earth is actually flat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a lot of people I know, at least in the US, that's super happy about this scene. You know, finally getting what they want. Yes, Evidence I think, of a flat earth. I think this movie might actually be propaganda from the flat earthers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so now we know the Earth is flat. And also there's a space monster. Yeah, we learned that's a lot. Why we, about... That's why we have the space station, for they are fighting off the space monster. Oh, so that's the real job. Exactly, so this is taken from real life. It's a true oh. story. Mm. So should we just say how it ends? Yeah, say it. Yeah, uh, they kill Seth, he becomes king. But since Beck and Saya are already dead, but uh, he uh, saved his father from death, so he grants him one wish, and he wishes them to be back to life. So they're back in life to life, and the movie pretty much ends with him being mm. king. Everyone is happy again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's it's like eating too much sugar. Yeah, yeah. and Beck is suddenly the chief advisor to Horus when he's king. Exactly, mm. because if you're good at dodging things, you're good at taking political decisions. Like That's he, how it he, works. He makes all of the worst decisions in, in this movie. He just he just wing it, wing it, and he still succeeds based on luck and nothing else. So he's perfect for an advisor, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's how it works. Okay, so let's let's rate the movie. Um, mm. I can start. This movie is. It's not bad per se. It's it's just too long, and they didn't really focus on on their on making the movie serious enough for us to just you know to watch. And they kind of stuck in the middle between the the, the the comedy and 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 the seriousness and and the drama, which. I don't like. I mean, this movie could have been good if they just focused on the drama and cutting down on the CGI effects. I mean, I know it's 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 a god world and big things exist and whatnot, but not everything needs to be this CGI mess and not everything needs to be a building collapsing and it's so close that they die, but they don't. And everybody knows that. So it's more of a, you know, you kind of just sighing through the movie because it's it's you, you already know what's going to happen and you're not surprised more than the error in Saya's heart at the beginning. But I think that was lazy writing. So I'm not super impressed by this movie, but I don't think it's bad. I think it's a perfect five. I think it's it's a perfect five for us. So I'm going to give it a, a hard five. For me, it's 
it's too much chaos and it's so much work or CGI work. It's just exhausting. And it's not even, it's not that the CGI is always bad. It's just too much of it that it looks unrealistic because of that. They could have scaled it back and it would have looked way better, but whatever. Uh, the actors are pretty cringe a lot of the times because most of them are theater acting instead of movie acting. I really only like Gerald Butler, I think. He has the he is the strongest actor in the movie for me. Uh, I like the setting. I really like Egyptian mythology and stuff. But I feel like they take a lot of liberties that kind of works against it sometimes and of course beck is horrible and the jokes that they force into the movie a thousand times over is really annoying i'm actually gonna give it three out of ten i think all right if you think about it this movie has a lot in common with almighty four that we also saw because also about the god that goes on a similar journey to take back the throne of the divine kingdom so i can appreciate this movie because it's not a bad movie but given the budget and what it could have been it's pretty disappointing because it's it's not hard to make a good movie if you can throw that much money at it. Uh, concept is interesting, CGI is disappointing, and you never really got to care about any of the characters. In the end, I'm going to give it 4 out of 10. Great, there we have it. There's not much more to say about this. Um, congrats to Flat Earth News, I think. Uh, <laughs> Remember that you can contact us at bmso.contact at gmail.com and we're happy for all sort of feedback and, uh, of course, examples of bad movies. See you next time. Bye. Bye.